Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, sorry for the quick turnaround on changing up links, but thank you for being here and for your patience. I wanna thank you for coming today and uh, we are hosting today's CNCF live webinar, Cubester, Identify, Validate, Evaluate, and now Browse. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm gonna to read our code of conduct and then hand it over to Michael Cage, Senior Technologist and member of technical staff and Suresh Bathina, member of the technical staff at Cast In by Veeam. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak, but there is a Q&A chat box uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to drop your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct and please be respectful of all fellow participants and presenters. The recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They will also be available via the registration links, which we will put on both links so that everyone is covered for the event and they will be on our YouTube page, um, the CNCF YouTube playlist online programs. With that, I will hand it over to Michael and Suresh. Awesome, thank you, Libby. Yeah, so as I said, so we wanted to come back and we wanted to talk about Cubester. So an open source project that initially was focused on identifying, validating and evaluating your Kubernetes storage and there's been some updates, so we wanted to come back and, and tell you about some of those. But first, kind of want to get into a bit of a recap around them uh, before we get to show off some of those those new features. And then then also share where, where you can find out more, how you can contribute, and all of that good stuff. So the goal of of the, the talk is how does this how how do how does cubes to help you when it comes to benchmarking and validating your your storage or how does it hit the easy button i think is what we initially said when it comes to your kubernetes storage but also think about this as a, a handy set of tools to have in your back pocket when it comes to having to to look into kubernetes storage now if you're in various different Kubernetes store, um, environments on a daily basis, this could become quite a handy little tool. Yes, you could do everything that we've done manually, um, but who wants to be doing it in a manual, um, laborious way when this enables us to automate a lot of the process and we'll get to some of the processes um, as we get through. And really the the key new feature that, that has been added to, to Kubester is the ability to to open up or fire up a, a file browser to inspect the contents or visualize the contents of your PVCs. Um, I've got Sarish here who can who can touch in a little bit more detail about what went into developing that and making that that happen. But if we if we go through a bit of a recap first of of Cubester and then we can get into the the new stuff. In fact, Sarish, why don't you? You give a little bit of a, a history and the motivation behind it, given that you were the the creator of of Cubester. Of course, Michael. Um, yeah. So in, initially, you know, at, at Cast and working at Cast, and you know, we faced a lot of customer issues where a lot of the times it wasn't um, the Casting's product's problem; it was just that the customer had miss. Uh, I'm sorry badly set up storage, right? Um, and that means maybe they're missing a CSI driver or the right snapshot class or whatever it may be, right? So we noticed a lot of these issues and you know, a lot of our cycles ended up going into figuring out why their storage was um, misconfigured, right? Um, so, you know, I started building a tool just to, just to kind of suss out any of the potential mistakes they may have made when setting up their storage and then after I had this tool, I realized that, you know, it was powerful enough that anybody that's dealing with Kubernetes storage may find some benefit out of using this tool, right? So again, what are the kind of issues that we normally saw in the field with storage set up correctly? Um, is it ready to take for data protection? As in, can you take snapshots? Um, do you have that set up correctly as well? And then also um, what we realized is that a lot of our customers were over provisioning their, their volumes. They were giving themselves too big of a volume than what they actually needed. 
Um, so, you know, one of the things that we decided that we should check is um, based on their application, right? Um, what size of volumes do they actually need, right? What type of volumes do they actually need? Do they need super fast SSD? Are they okay with standard SSD? Um, that kind of that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, once you um, once we built this tool, we realized that hey, we can now benchmark our storage, and um, this is great if you have a lot of options and you're trying to like figure out what your applications do and how do you benchmark that against the storage that you have available. Um, so yeah, I, I built this tool to initially just like I said, figure out customer issues, and and now we decided that we could benefit from it as well. Yeah, I think I'd add on that. So since the the launch of the the project back in I want to say April of this year, um, the the conversations that I've had around it has definitely, especially on larger clusters where you've got especially managed Kubernetes clusters where there's a lot of different options when it comes to Kubernetes storage, especially in the public cloud. Um, it's quite good for exactly what Saris just said about making sure that you've, if you if it, I found it a, a very easy tool to to quickly identify the storage that I have available, but also whether that underpinning infrastructure has been deployed to what I need that application to run on. Um, like different different nodes, different disks, different, there's so many characteristics that play a part into what the storage performance comes out of, especially in the public clouds. Having this little handy tool there as a, as a as a binary downloaded on any operating system, it enables you to quickly identify what is available and whether at that first part of deployment, whether you've deployed the right storage or the right um, infrastructure for for your Kubernetes cluster. And to and to Michael's point, like um, storage performance changes with a, a, a wide number of factors, right? The number of apps running in the cluster, the size of the volumes themselves. Um, and then you never know when uh, something goes wrong in, in, in your cluster and you wanna measure, hey, is my storage behaving the way it was from day one till now, right? And those kind of uh, de degradation of your storage could easily be like figured out with a tool that can measure your storage, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. You did a really good blog at the beginning of the launch around different, different public clouds, different configurations that gave out very different performance results as well, which is a really useful blog that's on cubester.io. But uh, yeah, I think just to go into those three areas that are there that were existing pre pre the new browse functionality and some other some other areas is one, it was that identify and that was the, okay, what are, what's the a very quick and easy, just run the Cubester binary and understand the various different storage options that you have present in the cluster. And it is super simple. Like if I've I've got um I've got the latest release here, and you can literally, and I'm on an EKS cluster, but it's the same regardless of whatever context you're in, it will run against that. You can see that it does some checks. You can see that it warns you if you're using a, a provider that's potentially going out of out of um uh support. But then here you can see that I've got the EBS CSI driver installed. It it knows that, it lists that. Um, it tells me what storage classes I have, the volume snapshot classes I also have within there. Um, and if I want to then start running the additional tests against that. But this initial identification is simply just run that cubester command and like get this output. It also knows that I've got an entry provisioner, which is by default there within an EKS cluster which is just the GP2. And obviously there's no CSI volume snapshot class in there because it's not available, but we can still run the performance against it as well. Um, yeah, um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, traditionally, what would somebody, what would an, uh, a normal Kubernetes user do, right? They would do kubectl get storage class, and then they'd see what storage classes they have, then have to do a get volume snapshot class. And then they'd have to like, you know, if they, if they had multiple provisioners, they'd have to look at, the details to figure out which one belongs to which and stuff like that. So this kind of consolidates everything and puts all the knowledge out there. Yeah. And this, and so the next point also just goes a little bit further onto that, especially around the CSI um, is that this, this validate enables us because it's quite easy 
and this will depend on the role in which you're playing out there in the in the Kubernetes world. If you're implementing implementing Kubernetes clusters on a daily basis, sometimes several, or you're at least the operations side, you're potentially seeing multiple different um, Kubernetes clusters. And we we know that that the the CSI implementation, if not there out of the box for a managed service provider, then there's some manual steps that you potentially have to go into. One being you have to create the volume snapshot class, or if you don't, obviously you don't have that functionality, that capability within that. So this tool will give you that quick feedback as to say, well, yeah, you've 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 got that and it's configured correctly. Um, this goes back to one of the pain points that Sarish mentioned around um, something that we discovered or we were seeing from a, a lot of customer bases maybe not like CSI had been implemented, but the volume snapshot class had not been implemented to take advantage of that. So we couldn't have, couldn't create volume snapshots against that storage class, which ultimately when you're coming into data management and you want to start leveraging that, it obviously falls down and, and doesn't work. So being able to validate that is an important um, task to, to be able to achieve that. And then the evaluation aspect is, okay, so, that goes back to how we were talking about the performance of that storage. So the makeup of that, whether it's the node type and the disk type that you're being that's being used on the particular um, cluster or the nodes within the cluster, they determine what IOPS you're going to get on the actual cluster itself. So what the evaluation part aspect of the tool does is, is it gives us access to an FIO pod that runs against that storage class that we determine and then it will give you back the information around what that what that storage is capable of and out of the box it has its own um like default fio config but you can bring your own so if you know the makeup of your application does something specific maybe like read backwards or something that the characteristics of your application, you can bring that FIO. FIO is not a new thing at all. It's been used for benchmarking for, for years and years, for as long as we've had spinning disks. And and this gives us the, the, the ability to test against your characteristics of your application. So just to like to summarize what, what's actually happening and what what's what is the project actually streamlining. Now, again, I mentioned at the very beginning, you could absolutely go and do this yourself, go and create your own pod, create your, your PVC, validate that the PVC is created, you take a snapshot of that, and then restore that into a clone. And you validated that your volume snapshot class is actually configured correctly and working and, and that your storage is capable of storage snapshots, or um, is configured correctly for, for snapshots within Kubernetes. But so what Kubester does, if you define it within your within the within the tool, is it's going to deploy that lightweight pod. It's going to deploy. Um, it's going to take the PVC and the persistent volume. It's then going to snapshot that and then clone it back to itself. And uh, maybe we can get into the demo later on this as well if we've got time. But we ran through this like extensively when we when we first um, when this first came came out. But really, that's an automated approach. It really is as simple as as running. If I if I just go back into here, if I just wanted to run uh, CSI check, and then I guess if I'd run this against anything, that won't work. That won't work. Um, uh, maybe just run Kubester by itself and see what options it gives. Yeah. Have. I was just I was trying to cheat and maybe I'd run it against the <laughs> EKS cluster, but clearly I haven't. Um, but what it does is it's going to go and create that that pod. It's go so I could run Kubester um, CSI check minus uh, V. I think it is or the S, S for storage S. EBS. This is definitely a live demo minus V <laughs> CSI AWS. BSC, and this will use the default as well. So this will be a hundred gig PVC, but it's going to go and create that. If I go into uh, actually, Michael, I think this uses only a uh, ten gig PVC, something smaller. The uh, the FIO check does it on a hundred gig PVC. Ah, yes, CSI checks. It is smaller. Um, okay. If I do, might even be a one gig now. Okay. 
in the default namespace, we should see this container is being created. If I do a kubectl get pvc as well, you should see that we've created our own pvc there to confirm one gig. Um, so, and then we're going to take the snapshot against that, and then we're going to release that and clear up after us. Uh, but I'll come back and, and show you what that report looks like after. Um, similar to, to what we do from an evaluation point of view. So when we're using FIO, again, it's going to deploy that pod and that lightweight OS, which includes FIO within, within that same pod. It's going to take a persistent volume, or create a persistent volume claim and a PV, and it's going to run a scan against that. And I think this is where that 100 gig is um, by default, but you can change that. And it's going to give you that that um, those FIO results out of the back of that. Yep. Um, yeah, it's all configurable. Like, like you said, um, you know, there's many options that, that you can use to change how it performs. We also allow you to pass in a uh, customized FIO file. So if you really know um, the requirements of your application in terms of performance, you can uh, simulate your application's load workload with the custom FIO file. And then once you pass that into that FIO command, um, you can more accurately test what your what your application needs, right? Yeah, so you can see here that this was the original pod that we created. You can see that it took a clone. If I did a like volume snapshot, we'd get that as well. But you can see here that we've we ran our we ran our initial cubes to CSI check. We created that pod. We created the pod and the PVC. We took a snapshot of this. We can see the name of the snapshot, and then we restored that to a cloned pod and a cloned PVC. And then we went away and we cleaned up everything. And then we got the report back saying successfully snapshotted and restored. So we know that the CSI um, driver that we're leveraging here is functional and, and able to, we've validated that things are configured correctly. Yeah. Okay. Come back into here. So when we look at the, the new functionality, the the idea, in fact, sorry, should you tell us what like how you came about and what what the reason was to add in the browse functionality into into Cubester? Sure. Um, again, it, it really came down to like customers customer requests saying, um, "Hey, I want to quickly get an insight into what my volumes have, especially when they're trying to kind of." track what has changed between snapshots because our customers take snapshots frequently and if they want to roll back they sometimes want to see the contents of a snapshot um so we kind of came up with this tool of how do we see what's inside of a pv pvc and you know what are different way, ways to visualize this right um and so so the thought process there was that well you know we could take a snapshot and then you know, for fun, we thought maybe we could put a, a browser in a pod and then deploy it against that that PV. And then that would be a, a interesting way to visualize it. So then, you know, we thought Kubester was a good place for that to land because, like I said, it's a toolbox and this could be just another tool in the toolbox. Um, and yeah, once we kind of had that there, you know, the thoughts process started spinning of mm. what could we put in this pod besides just a file browser, right? And we'll, we'll maybe touch a bit on that later in terms of where we can take this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But if we if we dive back into the the demo, and here's one I did definitely use earlier, so I do know that this one works. But before we do that, so basically, here I'm I'm going to run Kubester, the browse functionality against a, a PVC that I have called Mongo Storage, so MongoDB, um, on a from the volume snapshot class CSI AWS VSC in the namespace Pac-Man. Um, um, Michael, do you want to quickly list the the pod and the PVC just so people have an idea of what what the application itself looks like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. So if I we take a look at this, and then if we look at PVC dot Pac-Man, mission critical demo application. Um, <laughs> so you can see here that that. That's what we've got currently. If I set up a get pod 
namespace pacman watch and then we kick this off then in a similar way you're going it, to one it's going to give you the the output on this this screen um so obviously it's taken a snapshot to begin with in fact i probably should have done the the look at the volume snapshot as well but basically what we're going to do is we're going to that that snapshot's going to take place of the pvc and i'll we'll look back at that shortly because and then you get to see this pod which is this is the this is the browser that we're going to be exposing and port forwarding so that we get access to it through our browser so you can see here that we're we're, we're doing that and in the background we're, what we're also going to be doing is creating a clone and I'll, I'll touch on that after because nothing goes away but you can see okay that's running so we're now creating the file browser application within that pod and then the next stage is forwarding that port it should open a browser so this is now port forwarding so now i've got access to a clone copy of my pvc of my mongo db basically with all my mission critical high scores in there now this is probably a good point where sarish is where our our brains went afterwards is well where else could we go with that and this is probably where we want help or need help from the community for how do we how do we accomplish these uh these this vision yeah um and I, I mean obviously like a file browser to look at mongodb files may not be the best use case but you know let's say you have an, an application that stores images or has like media files or something like that this would be a much better representation or, or much better way to, to, to see the contents of those pvs and of course you can always like you know download those files uh through this browser if, if that's something that you need to do right um but but yeah like michael was saying that this is just like one application that we're deploying on your data maybe you have let's say in the, in the case of a if this is a, a mongodb if you have a, a better mongodb visualizer or, or something that you know um can let you better view the data if that can be deployed or containerized and deployed in a pod and then pointed towards this pvc then that would be an uh, an interesting use case where customers could have their own their, uh, a variation of i mean a variety of pods that they, they may want to run against their own data right uh, a variety of applications should i should say yeah um, and i think that opens up a, a huge door in that okay so the browse part is the the opening the door to that particular data but if you think about cloning that data and making it accessible especially a database such as Mongo, I don't know whether, like, I'm not a database expert by any stretch, but if you could take something like, um, I don't know, like MySQL Workbench, and I know that there are potentially web browser versions of that that we can implement into into pods. Um, same, I expect, for, for Mongo and various other Postgres, et cetera. And I think that becomes very interesting because at this point, we're on a clone of that data. We're not on the production, so think about this is this is our production PVC that's still serving data, and we can still get to that, and everything's still running for the for the end user. But what if we wanted to actually have a have insight into that data and start doing something with that as well? I think that becomes a very interesting roadmap idea as to where where Cubester goes like in the future. Um, for not only databases, but like Sarish said, around media files being able to, yeah, it's great that we can we can open that up here. If that was a if that was a group of um, images that were being stored in a flat file um, type storage, then we could definitely potentially leverage that somewhere else. But that whole visibility and being able to go in and leverage that data is kind of a, a an interesting interesting topic that we could we could definitely get into. Um, then once we're so it gives you the port forward all, all, all automatically happens i found that you needed um depending on the operating system that you're running x i think it's xdg that this is wsl that i'm using on windows so maybe that's a caveat that we just need to mention in there but but other than that it was pretty easy to get up and running download the binary start running it does give you a nice error saying xdg not found and i assume that's what the this process is pulling but once we're finished and we want to start getting rid of this we clean up all the resources and again if we go and take a look at the pods 
you'll see that we're terminating those pods, hopefully, and uh, cleaning up what we've just done from that. So, so then another. In fact, this was this was the um, one of the first community involvements out there first issue raised and i think it was a pr that came in sarish correct me if i'm wrong but um the ask was around arm support um arm support obviously out there and the, if we look at the the bigger bigger wider world around edge but also around other architectures for for home labs etc um getting used to again back going back to like the learning the learning curve of of kubernetes and storage being a, just another a hole that you could go down and spend a lot of time in is being able to run kubester across platforms is is hugely important because who knows where your kubernetes cluster potentially could be especially with the for the red um for the edge deployments that are out there so in the latest release it was we released the the ability to push that out to to the arm as well and not only that but Obviously, there's a lot of um, uh, Mac OS M1 laptops out there now um, that have that ARM processor. So that's also included here. I don't know. Have you got anything to add there, Sarish? It's... Um, no, I, like I said, the the peer, the suggestions came in saying that can you support ARM? And, you know, we decided, yeah, it's a, why not, right? Um, and like you know, we're we're trying to be more and more receptive to feedback. Um, so yeah, if you guys do have any anything you want to see in the future, um, please you know create an issue, uh, comment. Um, yeah, get get the word out there, and then we'll we'll do our best to 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 support that in the future. I realized I didn't didn't circle Windows ARM sixty four as well. My bad for that. <laughs> um, and then I saw this on a couple of issues as well. There was a few CSI drivers that, that were not added, not the AWS one. I'm just using this as an example. But where where we where it reports back and says this is a CSI driver, this is based on a a list, I assume, Sarish. And um there was a couple that I saw that we that we just had to update that list. Is that you probably yeah, so, better, um, better description? If, if you if, if you go through uh, Kubernetes website and try to find the list of CSI drivers, there's a list that's maintained there um, by, uh, I can't really, uh, let me try to find a link for that, but that's the list that has all the CSI drivers and that's the one that we source all our data from. So um, if, if you're up to date and you listed as a CSI driver there, uh, in the, then, then we'll get all your information as well as when we do uh, KubeSert. Uh, okay, so it's more of a yeah. If you've got a CSI driver, then make sure you're on that list, and Kubester will just pick it up. We didn't have to do anything to support well, it. Okay, it's more of just a you know we have I have to do a sort of a go generate, and it, it pulls all that information and then check in the file, right? So it's not it's not too big of a change, but uh, it's something that I could definitely do if yeah. you if you don't I see know. your driver listed here. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was there was some vendors out there that that wanted it. Now I've kind of already ran through um, the demo side of things. Um, although in the chat, let us know if there's anything you'd like to see. If you, if this is the first time you're seeing Kubester, then you might want to see the FIO. Um, I think there was some other enhancements around the FIO um, JSON output as well. Sarish, I didn't put it into a slide, but I don't know if there's something else or anything else from a recent release that you want to touch on i'll leave this up and then we'll talk talk about getting getting hands on and using it um no i think you covered most of the high level ones of course there's a lot of smaller little issues that we yeah. fixed but um yeah the high level ones yeah you got most of them um in terms of fio i think there's a question about the blog um do you remember where that blog is michael i think it was on cncf website if i'm not mistaken yeah, let me. I thought. Oh, yeah, we did put it on CNCF. That might be. That's our 
live stream uh benchmarking evaluated let me i don't know if i can pop that in the oh no that was another one that was my one Here we go. It's this one. Is there a chat that I can post this in? Yeah. There we go. Post it in the chat. Yeah, so I guess guess where we wanted to go is is firstly like how do you get hands on to it? So I've, I've put a couple of um QR codes up here that that should still be working. One is to cubester.io and that's that first site that I actually went to where I thought the blog was. And that's where you're going to get instructions, but also some resources. Me and Sarish have spoken quite a bit about about Cubester over the last six months um, in all different forms. So whether that's blogs, webinars like this, or like general general sessions um, around the functionality and walking through what that looks like. We did a live stream um, as well with the CNCF where it was all demo. So we, we batted around a bit and um, went through the functionality around that. And in particular showed that um, bring your own FIO type file as well, which is super simple to, if you've got access to those, which FIO is is a, an open source tool as well. Um, so all of the, the examples are, are also listed on GitHub. So you can go and grab hold of those. Um, simply put, to, to get started with Kubester, to install the tool, um, go and grab the the binaries. Again, you'll get to see it in the in the release and the assets of, of GitHub. You'll see this long list of of, uh, of files. Um, another way, another, yeah, another way to install it is using another open source tool called Arcade, A R K A D E, and we've just recently added quite a few open source tools that we're that we're um, looking after from a from a custom point of view. Um, Cubester being one of those. So being able to go to Arcade arcade get cubester and it will go and download based on your os based on your architecture and it will go and download and install um or put the cubester binary in the right place within your system um the other area that i've been using it um i know i didn't show it but basically just downloading the binary and then putting it into your um path as a a cube ctl plugin as well basically just changing the the binary so that it's always there it's always handy to to have um just in that that element on whatever whatever Kubernetes context you're on, um, and you can see, yeah, that the various different uh, commands that we kind of went through. But even even that within the within the binary, when you run that, there's quite good help um, functionality. If 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 we're missing something, then please let us know on that that front as well. Um, I think our closing thoughts, if there's depending on if there's any questions, but happy to answer the question, show anything that we need to on, on Kubester. But I think our biggest ask is take a look, um, whether that's just using it just to see if it's useful. Um, but also that feedback and the contributions is, is huge for us to, but like we really think this is useful. Um, you could, you already heard that we had some ideas. We had some other ideas before as well about how do we visualize that FIO output? Um, and how do we how do we yeah how do we visualize that um then also spreading the word like if it was useful it'd be great for us to spread it around the community let's make everyone's life a little bit easier especially when it comes to kubernetes storage we're all gonna have to we're, we're all learning all different stuff and everything's got to be at a level um and yeah our biggest takeaway is it's a handy little tool for for benchmarking your your kubernetes storage it's one of them things to have in your back pocket just to quickly spin up and, and use. Um, is there any questions, Suresh? I can't see the chat. So. Um, yeah, there, there's no questions in the chat, but just to reiterate what Michael was saying, you know, we, we really value contributions from the community. Um, 
we had a, a couple going to this last release. Um, you know, we're very grateful for for that. Um, and yeah, like like I said, a, hand, a handy little tool for benchmarking your storage. But more than that, just a way to explore your storage options. And then also now, you know, the browse feature lets you just ob observe and um, explore your, your PVCs as well. And, you know, we'd like to know what else you guys want to see out of this tool. Um, where do you want to see it go? And what, what do you think we should add to it? Yeah, I'm super excited to see how how we can progress and start visualizing database and other data services that that would be also useful in that in that browse functionality. Yeah. But yeah, I think with that, I think unless anyone wants to see anything specific. Any questions, anyone else? Yeah, Musa makes a good point. Seeing that DB being spun up um, in the same pod, like basically acting as that uh, as the visualization for the data would be super. Yeah, interesting. how how I see that working is, you know, you run the browse function, and then you can pass in any image that you'd want to pass into that that function, right? Um, and then if your image is, happens to be some sort of a, a database visualization visualization tool. And that's what you could do. Yeah, definitely something something to look at when we get some time. Yep. Very cool. Are there any other questions, everyone? All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us. Like I said, we'll get this online um, ASAP this afternoon and hopefully in the next hour so that anyone that wasn't able to join can view it. Um, oh, here we've got one. How can we get the certificate? Can you share the link? Um, when you say certificate, Srinivasa, do you mean um, in order to install the app? Um, I, I don't think we have signed certificates yet. So, um, that's something that's something that we have to work on. That's probably uh, one 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 of the uh, yeah more um, more requested items. So that's yeah, probably top of the list in getting that done. As well that we we started a Slack channel that could be useful for the community to communicate with as well. So I'll just pop that link in there. Awesome. But again, everything's open on GitHub, so issues is a good place to, to start. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, hit up that Slack channel if you have any questions uh, for everybody post-event. And we will see you all next time. Thank you, everybody, so much. And thank you, Michael and Sharish. Thanks, Libby. Thanks.